Hello friends. As we all know, we radiologists generally do not interpret chest radiograph. Generally, it is done by physicians. However, it is very important that we understand the basics of chest radiograph interpretation because it is the basic investigation modality followed in today's clinical practice. As doctors, we need to know the basics of chest radiology. Whichever specialty we may choose, it will definitely help us in day-to-day -day practice. I will be discussing the entire chest radiology in a series of videos. In today's video, I am going to discuss about the radiological anatomy of chest. Before we begin, myself, Dr. Alina Elizabeth Andrews, currently doing my residency in radio diagnosis in Kerala. I hope this humble initiative will help you all. So before moving further, let us outline the topics I'll be discussing in this video. As part of the anatomy of chest, I'll be dealing with the lung fields, hilum, airways, mediastinum, diaphragm, bony cage, extrathoracic soft tissues, fissures, and finally on the zones. I will also be highlighting few aspects on how to look at them from the radiologist point of view. So friends, let's begin. First, I'll be talking about the lung fields. Regarding the lung fields, I'll be telling about the laterality as well as vascularity. Let's look at them one by one. As you can see, the black area, which is also referred to as the radiolucent area, represents the lung field. As soon as you get a film, you have to assign the side. That is, which one is right and which is left. Most often, it will be represented in one of the corners. As in this figure, it is seen in the left upper corner. Always remember, the right side of the patient is on your left side, whereas the left side of the patient will be on the right side. Confirm the laterality based on what is given in the radiograph and always remember, never assume the side based on the apex of the heart or by looking at the gas shadow of the stomach. You may often end up getting wrong. Now let's move on to the second aspect to assess in the lung field, which is the vascularity. In the given image, you can see radio dense lines radiating from the center to the periphery. These dense lines represent the pulmonary vasculature along with the connective tissue septa. If you observe the pattern clearly, you can see they become fine and thinner as they go towards the peripheral one-third of lung. This is normal. Another pattern that you have to observe carefully is the way these lines vary from top to bottom. Look carefully and you can see that the lines increase in number as well as size as you move from top to bottom. This is normal. So these two patterns you have to keep in mind. Thus, we have finished the lung fields. Now, we'll move over to the hilum. In the hilum, we'll be discussing about the level, the density and the shape. First and foremost question, what is hilum? What is hilum made of? I'm marking out in the figure, observe these two lines. The upper one, represents the superior pulmonary vein and the lower one represents the descending pulmonary artery. These two join and form an acute angle. This angle, this junction is called as hilar point. So the hilum is formed by the junction of these two vessels anatomically and that's what you look for in the radiological image of chest, especially in the x-ray. Now we'll move over to each aspect in defining the hilum. Firstly, the level. As clearly marked out in the diagram, you can see the two arrows. What is striking? There is a high difference between the right and left side, right? This is normal. That is, in 97% of cases, the left hilum is higher than right. So, to put it in other words, the left hilum is almost always higher than the right or at most, it can be at the same level as right, but never below the right. Keep this point in mind because one of the aspects in assessing the hilum is looking for the level. 
Keep this high difference in your mind. Coming to the next aspect in assessing the hilum will be about the density. It is a rule in radiology. Whenever you are comparing radiographs or any imaging modality, compare the sides. Compare the right and left side. The same rule applies in hilum too. That is, you have to look for the symmetry. Symmetry in the size. Symmetry in the density. So in this image, you can see as pointed out by the arrows, the right and the left side, the hilum, they appear more or less similar in density. This is normal. Any abnormality in the density, say if one side appears dense, which means that side is pathological. Well, this is not the 100% rule. So if one side is denser, it may point to a pathology. For example, any lymphadenopathy can make that hilum look more dense. So, looking at the hilum, first is level, next the density. Coming to the third aspect, it will be the shape. So, remember friends, what I told about the hilar angle. It's an acute angle formed between the superior pulmonary vein and descending pulmonary artery. So, this angle is concave. Any convexity, mind you, any convexity should ring a bell. It could be pathological. So, any convexity may be due to abnormality in the vessels in the hilum, maybe an aneurysm, maybe a dilated vessel, or it could be any added structure there, for example, a lymphadenopathy. So, all this will impart convex shape to the hilum. So, I hope that much is clear. So, we have finished the lung fields and the hilum. Now, let's move over to the airways. So, in the figure, I'm marking out the trachea, as you can see, the radiolucent shadow through the dense structure in the middle yes you trace it down you see the right bronchus and you trace it down you see the left bronchus so if you review what you've learned in anatomy the right bronchus is in continuity with the trachea right the same thing can be observed in the radiograph too and this is one of the reasons why foreign body lodges more often in the right bronchus or preferentially to the right bronchus or in our clinical routine practices whenever you try to intubate a patient if it is the technique is not correct or say accidentally more likely that you intubate the right bronchus right so this is the clinical significance of knowing that the right bronchus is more or less in continuity with the trachea so these are the two major airways that you can easily see in the radiograph. Now, another important point that you have to know when you think about airways is the carina. Carina is the angle formed between the right and the left bronchus. So remember, the clinical significance is that the angle formed at the carina. It is usually acute or let's say it is in the range of 60 to 70 degrees. Why is it significant? Any pathology affecting the mediastinum, uh, we'll come to mediastinum later, will cause abnormality in the carinal angle. To cite clinical examples would be, the carina will appear widened in case of mediastinal lymphadenopathy to be specific subcarinal lymph node enlargement. Another important cause of widened subcarinal angle is the left atrial enlargement. So this is one of the favorite questions of examiners, especially in the MBBS level for the medicine exams. The cause of left atrial enlargement the first cause that comes up top on the list would be mitral stenosis. So, one important aspect in diagnosis MS, mitral stenosis in radiograph would be by looking for the left atrial enlargement which can be seen in one of the ways as widened subcarinal angle. So far, we have covered the lung fields, the hilum, the airways. Now going to the next topic, which is mediastinum. So the dense structure, the radiodense white structure that you see in the center of the radiograph, that is the mediastinum. It encompasses the airways, the major airways like trachea, the bronchi, we've already discussed that, and also the heart, as you can see here, the great vessels, this would be the iota, and this would be the pulmonary artery. So let's mark out the borders. As you can see, the right heart border is formed by the right atrium below and the superior vena cava above. Clear? Whereas in the left side, it is mainly formed by the left ventricle. The upper part is formed by the left atrium. And still higher up, this prominent 
knob like thing which is known as the aortic knuckle or the aortic knob and in between you can see in a structure like this right which is the pulmonary artery so to summarize the right heart border is formed by the right atria and the superior vena cava whereas the left heart border from bottom to top is formed by the left ventricle then part of left atrium the pulmonary artery also referred to as the pulmonary bay and further up the aortic knuckle i hope that's clear so so far we have finished the lung fields the hilum the airways the mediastina now going over to the diaphragm in the diaphragm you can see as in the shown in the figure this is the right hemidiaphragm this is the left hemidiaphragm so what is striking in this yes of course it is the high difference again remember similar high difference was also applicable for the hilum so in comparing the diaphragm you can see that the left diaphragm is at a lower level than the right why this is because the heart is pushing down the diaphragm so the left diaphragm is at a lower level than the right so a question that naturally comes up is up to what level this is normal so up to about 3 cm the high difference between the right and left with the left diaphragm being lower can be taken as normal now another important aspect in assessing the diaphragm is that it gives us clue regarding the lung volume or regarding the inspiratory status of the film we all know that the x-ray is taken in adequate good inspiration why do we need to take the film in inspiratory mode will be discussed in the coming lectures to assess the same all you need to do is count the ribs as you can see in the film the obliquely oriented ones are the anterior ribs and the relatively more horizontally oriented ones are the posterior ribs so by the rule an adequately inspired film should have its sixth anterior rib and around ninth to tenth posterior rib cutting the dome of the diaphragm so i repeat an adequately inspired film should have the sixth anterior rib and the tenth posterior rib cutting the dome of the diaphragm speaking of diaphragm i like to introduce you to another important aspect that which you need to assess in chest radiograph which is the costophrenic angle so as i'm marking it out here the sharp acute angle is formed by the contact of the pleura with the diaphragm is known as the costophrenic angle and this should be acute and sharp any blunting i repeat any blunting signifies pathology it could be due to pleural thickening or it could be due to pleural effusion next let's discuss about bones as it is evident from the film the lungs and the mediastinum are enclosed in a bony thoracic cage so you can see the horizontal clavicles here the scapula here you can see that the scapula is partly obliterating the lung fields in this frontal pa view other bones forming are the ribs that we have already discussed so remember friends the anterior ribs are more obliquely oriented and posterior ribs are more horizontally oriented and also never forget to look through the mediastinum and look through the mediastinum and see the vertebra so you can see this is the vertebral body and further up if you look carefully these structures these are the spinous processes of vertebra so whatever possible look through the mediastinum the dense shadow to see if it is able so what whenever possible look through the dense white structures of mediastinum and try to take a look at the bones that is and try to take a look at the vertebra this prompts me to just mention about an anatomical variant so in the image you can see this is a clavicle if you look carefully paralleling the superior border of the clavicle you get another dense structure marked in arrows what are they these are known as the companion shadows that is they are formed by the skin folds overlying clavicle so 
Never mistake them for any gross pathology. Keep this in mind. Thus, we've covered the lung fields, hilum, airways, mediastinum, diaphragm, bony cage. Next, we're going to talk about the extrathoracic soft tissues. Really, are they important? What possible things can you say about the soft tissue? Well, there are a lot to tell in soft tissues. Presenting before you three radiographs. So first, let's take the one in the top right corner. If you look carefully, the left lung field appears more loosened, that is more darker than the right. Can you say why? Look carefully. You can see the breast shadow on the right side. Can you point it out on the left side? No. So, this is a case of absent breast shadow on the left. So, how do we pick it up? There are two clues. First and foremost, as soon as you get the radiograph, when you look at it, you feel that the left lung appears more loosened. Another way is that you have to look for symmetry. Again, as I said, symmetry is a rule. You see that there is an added density corresponding to the breast contour on the right side. Can you make it out on the left side? No. So, there is absence of breast on the left side. Now, let's take the image on the left corner. Can you make out anything abnormal in that? Well, if you look carefully, on the left side, this lung appears slightly loosened as compared to the right. That is slightly darker as compared to the right. I've provided a clue in the form of an arrow here. Let's see. This is the clinical radiograph of the patient. As you can see in the figure A, on the left side, the chest wall appears thinner or let's say it is lacking something as compared to the right side. So this is a case of absent pectoralis muscle. An important clinical clue from the figure A would be obviously less dense soft tissue on the anterior aspect of the left side of chest. At the same time, you can see the prominent horizontal axillary fold. The same thing you can make it out in the radiograph. See, the lung is more loosened because the chest wall is lacking the normal soft tissue as compared to the right. Compare, compare, compare. Along with that, you can see the horizontal axillary fold. So this is a case of pollen syndrome. Finally, we are going to the next topic, which is about the fissures. We all know that the right lung has two fissures, the major and the minor, whereas the left lung has only a single fissure, which is the major fissure. So a question gradually arises. Can you see the fissure? If yes, which all? So in a frontal radiograph, you can see only the minor fissure. So look on the right side, as outlined in the arrow, this horizontal dense line radiating from the center, radiating from the hilum to the periphery towards the axilla. This is the side of the minor fissure. So in a frontal radiograph, you can visualize only the minor fissure. So before concluding, I feel the need to talk on zones of lung. Here is the chest radiograph. Why do you need to divide the lung into various zones? This is for the purpose of localization to communicate regarding where the pathology is situated. For example, I have a lesion here. How do I describe it? For this, the lungs have been divided into zone, the upper, mid and the lower. These are demarcated by the ribs. So, the upper zone is limited by the lower border of the anterior rib. So, here you can see the anterior rib obliquely. The upper border is limited by the lower border of the anterior rib and the middle zone is between the second to fourth ribs. That is the lower border of the anterior second and fourth rib, whereas the lower zone is below that. Friends, now let us summarize what we have seen in this video. We have seen about the major parts of the chest radiograph, the lung field, the hilum, the airways, etc. I have discussed about the major aspects we need to focus in each of the above parts. I have also discussed about the importance of symmetry in reading chest radiograph. I have also briefed about the do's and don'ts to be followed. I hope the video was useful for each one of us. With the coming set of videos, I am hopeful to take you through the art of interpreting radiological modalities. With this note, let me thank to my viewers. Thank you everyone.